Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is the 1908 Cleveland Naps ALMLB baseball season. Again, the Naps were playing in the American League, and uh, they were also they're playing home games here in Cleveland at League Park, East 66th and Lexington. 1908 was one of the best uh, years in Cleveland pro baseball. Remember, this is. The Naps were the Cleveland Indians franchise. They, they would take the name Indians in seven years in 1915. So they had an outstanding year. The Naps finished in second place with a record of 90 and 64. So that's 26 games over 500. A winning percentage of 584. Really, really good. And they finished one half game out of first place. In other words, 0.5. Really crazy. Uh, you know, as close as you can get. The first place team was the Detroit Tigers, who were 90 and 63. Second place, the Cleveland Naps, 90 and 64. Third place, the Chicago White Sox, 88 and 64. Fourth place, the St. Louis Browns had a, had a good year. They were 83 and 69. In 1954, the St. Louis Browns moved to Baltimore and became the Baltimore Orioles. Fifth place team was the Boston Red Sox, who were 75 and 79. Sixth place, the Philadelphia Athletics, who were 68 and 85. And in 1955, they moved to Kansas City, became the Kansas City A's, or Athletics. And in 1968, uh, then they moved again to Oakland, became the Oakland A's, where they remain today. And the seventh place team was the Washington Senators, who were 67 and 85. Uh, they moved in 1961 uh, to Minneapolis, became the Minnesota Twins. And the eighth place team was the New York Highlanders, uh, who were 51 and 103, 39 and a half games out of first place. Five years later, in 1913, they would officially take the name the New York Yankees. And of course, had, they've dominated uh, Major League Baseball ever since. Spring training in 1908 was in Macon, Georgia. On, on June 9th, the Naps set an, a Major League Baseball record. Every player in the lineup hit safely and scored in the fifth inning against Boston in a game that Cleveland won 15-6. Now, the strange thing is they finished one half game out of first. Uh, the Tigers uh, had one game they did not play because of rain. Now, under the rules of that time, it did not require that game to be played. Now, this would not happen today. Under today's rules, the Tigers would have to play that game, and if they, if they won the game, then they would win the, win the pennant by one game. If they had lost that game, then there would have been a tie. We would have been tied with Detroit, and would have had, there would have been a, a one-game playoff played between Cleveland and Detroit. So we were so close to getting to the World Series. Anyway, we didn't make it. Uh, it was a real stressful pennant race for the fans, especially pres the team president, John Kilfoyle, who resigned after the, after the season because he felt that he just couldn't take it anymore with all this stress that he was going through because he was really living and dying uh, with the team. He was replaced by Barney Barnard, who built Major League Baseball's first farm system for Cleveland and the Naps took control of a number of minor league teams, including those in Toledo and Ironton, Ohio, Waterbury, Connecticut, Portland, Oregon, and New Orleans, Louisiana. This meant that uh, you know teams, uh, players could who were doing well could be brought up to Cleveland, and Cleveland would control all those teams. Uh, formerly, and the the old system was uh, basically the minor league teams were selling their top players to to the highest bidder. 1908, the year in question, was also the year of Fred Merkel's famous boner, which cost the Giants the pennant in the National League. Yeah, there was a game in which the Giants looked like the game-winning the game -winning run had scored. Merkel was a runner at first base, he, and there were two out, and he did not touch second base in the ninth inning. And then the opposing team got the ball and touched second, so uh, which meant that... Uh, the, the winning run didn't count, and that meant that cost the Giants that game and meant they, that they did not, uh, they did not win, the, uh, win the National League pennant. So he was forever blamed for that. Poor guy had to, had to live with that. 
White Sox pitcher Ed Walsh won 40 games. Wow, really something. Now, the Cleveland Naps, uh, their pitching was the best in Major League Baseball, a team ERA of 2.02. Wow, incredible. Uh, again, the Cleveland, uh, they set a, a, a Cleveland attendance record was set. Total attendance at uh, League Park for Naps games was 422,262. For the first time, Cleveland attendance uh, hit the 400,000 mark and an average of 5,484 per game. Kate Murphy, C-A-I-T, was a uh, writer at the time and made, made a very strong case that 1908 was the best season in Major League Baseball history and wrote this, quote, Besides two agonizing pennant races and history's finest pitching duel, the year is full of iconic performances by baseball's first generation of iconic heroes, i.e. Tinker's Evers Chance, Honus Wagner, Ty Cobb, Christy Mathewson, Napoleon Lajoie, Cy Young, Walter Johnson. In the dugouts were Connie Mack and John McGraw, opposites in temperament, and united in their passion for the game. The whole season was rife with drama, comic, tragic, odd, and merely incredible. On September 18th uh, at League Park, 16,000 fans came uh, to see Cleveland win a game against uh, Boston, and the fans uh, stormed the field afterward. Bill Bradley had the walk-off game-winning hit, and the fans put Bradley on their shoulders and paraded around the diamond. That's when they used to allow fans on the on the field after a game. On Sept- September 21, the Naps were in first place, and the Cleveland Plain Dealer reported, quote, Hooray! Rural Ohio joined in on the excitement. Visitors to farm country reported that after a long day in the fields, Farmers were driving miles to the nearest telegraph office to stand around and talk baseball until the operator gave scores. I'm reading a fine book which is helping me in my research. It's called The Cleveland Indians by Franklin Whitey Lewis, 1949, and republished in 2006. In 1908, in Major League Baseball, hitting was way down and pitching was dominant. It was large, a large part of that was because of the spitball had become very popular among pitchers and was still legal and very tough to hit. Pitchers were also doctoring the ball with grass stains, tobacco juice. They were carving ridges into the co- cover of baseball, which made it uh, very hard uh, to predict the, uh, the flight of the ball. As games would progress, the balls would get darker and softer, make, making it much harder to hit, hit well. In September, the Sporting Life reported this, quote, The Cleveland Naps deserve extra credit because they have played clean ball. They have not disgraced themselves by upbursts of profanity on the diamond. They have played a sportsmanlike game. That is why Larry's Nine is the most popular ball team, with the possible exception of the Giants, in the land today. Now again, the uh, Cleveland uh, player manager was Napoleon Lajoie, who played... uh, was a full-time second baseman. Lajoie hit 289, 32 doubles, 6 triples, 2 home runs, 74 RBIs, 15 stolen bases in 100, 157 games. Lajoie was with Cleveland from 1902 to 1914, and 1908 was the high point of the Lajoie era in Cleveland. Henry P. Edwards of the Cleveland Plain Dealer wrote this, quote, Napoleon Lajoie bowed his head as the tears streamed down his cheeks the night of October 5, 1908. Why did he cry? Because the Cleveland Naps, of which, of which he was the manager, had lost the pennant by half a game. There was an exhibition game in March in New Orleans, Louisiana, and Lajoie and the, and the, and the players explored through the French Quarter in New Orleans, Lajoie was fluent in French and impressed his teammates speaking with the people there in French. Maybe they didn't know that. His, his mother actually never learned French, so he grew up. French was his first language. During the 1908 season, Lajoie set an American League record for assists. He also led the, le- the league in putouts, double plays, and fielding percent- percentage, so he had a fine year as a defensive second baseman along with his hitting. The Naps were eliminated in St. Louis, and at the very end of the year, Lajoie met uh, William Howard Taft there, who was running for U.S. president and was elected 
in 1908. Lajoie said this, quote, I hope you have better luck than we did. And Taft responded, quote, quote I, ho- I hope to win, and I'm sorry that, that a team from my home state didn't land the pennant, but you did well. Now, the Naps catcher for 1908 was Nig, Nig Clark. Clark hit 241, eight doubles, six triples, a home run, 27 RBIs, six stolen bases in 97 games. Clark played for Cleveland from 1905 to 1910. Uh, Clark asked Lajue uh, for a few days off uh, during the season because he was anxious to see his new wife. He was, I think she was pregnant. He was worried about her, and Lajue said no. And Clark was very upset, and he d- reportedly deliberately stuck his in- index finger in the path of a pitch, hoping to get a bruise so he could take a few days off to see his wife. Uh, However, there was a bloody break, and he missed five weeks of the season. You know, when you since they lost the pennant by a half a game, everyone was looking for, you know, for for reasons, and you could say this was one of the reasons they lost their starting catcher for five weeks because he deliberately hurt himself. And anyway, that was very unfortunate. Uh, George Stovall was the first baseman. Stovall hit 292, very good, 29 doubles, wow, six triples, two home runs, 45 RBIs, 14 stolen bases in 138 games. Stovall was with Cleveland from 1904 to 1911. At League Park in 1908, there was an advertising sign beyond the, uh, that was visible beyond the outfield fence for a local shoe store, and it, it's indicated that a free pair of shoes would be given to a player who hit a triple. Anytime a player hit a triple, they'd get a free pair of shoes. And Stovall said this, quote, I can cl- clearly remember 17 instances when the fellows on our team were out trying to stretch hits into triples. It was that darn sign staring them in the face. They were all trying to get themselves another pair of shoes. So this could be another factor and you know, in them not making it to the World Series. Some of the games they may have lost because of guys trying to get a free pair of shoes and getting thrown out of third base. George Stovall. The shortstop in 1908 was George Pairing. Pairing hit 216. He had eight doubles, five triples, 19 RBIs, eight stolen bases in 89 games. And Pairing was from Sharon, Wisconsin. He died in Belwa, Wisconsin in 1960 at age 76. Career average of 248, nine home runs, 183 RBIs. Pairing played for the Cleveland Naps and Kansas City Packers from 1908 to 1915. The the Kansas City Packers were in the Federal League, which was a third major league between 1913 and 1915. And Pairing went to Belois College. George Pairing. Bill Bradley was the third baseman again. Bradley hit 243. He had 24 doubles, seven triples, A home run, 46 RBIs, 18 stolen bases in 148 games. Bradley was with Cleveland from 1901 to 1910. On September 19th at League Park, that game against the the Naps and Red Sox, as I mentioned earlier, Bradley had the walk-off single in the bottom of the ninth inning that broke a 5-5 tie. The crowd surged onto the field and carried Bradley on their shoulders around the field while drums uh, were played and, and there were horns tooted. And there was a parade on the field for for half an hour, 15,600 fans. So they, and it was the old days before they finally stopped having, letting the fans go on the field after games. Bill Bradley. In the outfield, Bill Hinchman was a regular outfielder. Hinchman hit 231, 23 doubles, 8 triples, 6 home runs, 59 RBIs, and 9 stolen bases in 137 games. Hinchman was with Cleveland from 1907 to 1909, so this was his second of three years in Cleveland. On October 4th in St. Louis, Hinchman had what they called a boner or a mistake in the ninth inning. Hinchman had a tie-breaking hit. It appeared to give the the Naps a 4-3 lead in the ninth inning. However, he was called out at first base, so the run did not count. And some claim that Hinchman did not run at full speed. And the game was tied after 11 innings, so it had to be replayed the next day. So we did not win, win the game. Again, if we had won that game, 
you know, we would have uh, won the pennant, but we didn't. So Bill Hinchman, this is a tough thing for athletes they have to live with. I'm sure all the guys on the team were thinking of things that they had done, oh, that uh, meant that they did not win, uh, didn't make it to the World Series. So Hinchman had to live with this, so, which is unfortunate. Bill Hinchman. Another regular outfielder was Joe Birmingham. Birmingham hit 213, 10 doubles, a triple, two home runs, 38 RBIs, 15 stolen bases in 122 games. Birmingham was with Cleveland from 1906 to 1914. And uh, during Addy Josh, Josh threw a perfect game in 1908. Uh, Cleveland won one to nothing. And Birmingham was the guy who, who scored the run. He had a single. And then he delayed steal. He got a real big lead off first, drawing the throw. And as soon as he saw the pitcher starting the throw, he took off for second. And the throw hit him in the head. He was able to get to third base on the, on the throw, which went into center, and then scored on a wild pitch. So that was really something. Joe Birmingham. Another uh, regular outfielder was Josh Clark, who hit 242. Eight doubles, four triples, a home run, 21 RBIs, uh, 37 stolen bases in 131 games. Clark was from Winfield, Kansas. He died in Ventura, California in 1962 at age 83. Career average of 239, five home runs, 43 RBIs. Clark played for the Louisville Colonels, St. Louis Cardinals, Cleveland Naps, and Boston Rustlers between 1898 and 1911. His brother is Halt was Halt. Baseball Hall of Famer Fred Clark, Josh Clark. Now the bench players included Harry Harry Bemis, who was a spare catcher. Bemis hit 224, 62 hits, nine doubles, a triple, 33 RBIs, 14 stolen bases in 91 games. And Bemis was with Cleveland from 1902 to 1910. Harry Bemis. Terry Turner was a utility player. Turner hit 239, 48 hits, 11. Doubles, a triple, 19 RBIs, 18 stolen bases in 60 games. Turner was with Cleveland from 1904 to 1918. He was actually our regular shortstop and was injured and missed most of the year. Terry Turner. Charlie Hickman was another utility player. Hickman hit 234, 46 hits, 6 doubles, a triple, 2 home runs, 16 RBIs, 2 stolen bases in 65 games. Hickman was with Cleveland from 1902 to 1904, and then he returned in 1908. So this was the end of his time in Cleveland. Charlie Hickman. Wilbur Good was another outfielder. Good hit 279, 43 hits, a double, three triples, a home run, 14 RBIs, seven stolen bases in 46 games. Good was from Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. He died in Brooksville, Florida in 1963 at age 78. Career average of 258, 9 home runs, 187 RBIs, and 104 stolen bases. Good played for the New York Highlanders, Cleveland Naps, Boston Doves, Boston Rustlers, Chicago Cubs, Philadelphia Phillies, and Chicago White Sox between 1905 and 1918. Wilbur Good. Dave Altizer played some outfield and shortstop. Altizer hit 213. He had 19 hits, a double, two triples, five RBIs, seven stolen bases in 29 games. Altizer played for the Altizer was from Pearl, Illinois. He died in Pleasant Hill, Illinois, in 1964 at age 87. He played for the Washington Senators, Cleveland Naps, Chicago White Sox, and Cincinnati Reds between 1906 and 1911. Career average of 250, four home runs, 116 RBIs, and 433 hits. Dave Altizer. Elmer Flick was a, another outfielder. Flick hit 229, eight hits, a double, a triple, two RBIs in nine games. Flick was with Cleveland from 1902 to 1910. He was very ill during spring training, and he had lost a lot of weight, so he, he was limited. He only played, he had been our star outfielder, but only played in nine games because he was sick during the 1908 season. Elmer Flick. Rabbit Nill was a utility player. Nill hit 217. He had five hits, 23 at bats, an RBI in 11 games. And this was uh, Nill's second and last year in Cleveland. Rabbit Nill. Grover Land was a spare catcher. Land hit 188. He had three hits 
in 16 at-bats, two RBIs in eight games. Land was from Frankfort, Kentucky. He died in Phoenix, Arizona in 1958 at age 73. Career average of 243, three home runs, 80 RBIs. Land played for the Cleveland Naps and Brooklyn Tip Tops in the Federal League from 1908 to 1915. Grover Land. Otto Hess uh, was an outfielder and a pitcher. He batted 14 times, did not get a hit, had one walk, struck out five times in nine games. His pitching record, he had no decisions. ERA of 5.14 in four games, seven innings pitched. Otto Hess was with Cleveland from 1902 to 1908, so this was the end of Otto Hess's time in Cleveland, and he'd been a fine pitcher for the Cleveland Naps. Otto Hess. Denny Sullivan was an outfielder who generally played center field. Uh, Sullivan batted six times, did not get a hit, struck out once in four games. Sullivan was from Hillsboro, Wisconsin. He died in West Los Angeles, California in 1956 at age 73. Career average of 239, one home run, 51 RBIs. Sullivan played for the Washington Senators, Boston Americans, Boston Red Sox, and Cleveland Naps between 1905 and 1909. He was considered a fine outfielder with a light bat, Denny Sullivan. Deacon McGuire was a first baseman. McGuire hit 250. He had one hit in four at-bats. That hit was a double, and he knocked in two runs in one game. And McGuire had played for the Cleveland Blues in 1888, 20 years before. So he was back in Cleveland and got in one game with the Cleveland Naps. Deacon McGuire. Homer Davidson was a utility player. Davidson batted four times, did not get a hit. However, he scored two runs and had a stolen base. He must have got on base through an error in nine games, did not get any walks. Davidson was from Cleveland, Ohio. He died in Detroit, Michigan in 1948 at age 63. And his MLB career was just with the Cleveland Naps in 1908. Davidson was actually a professional football player. He played in the Ohio League predecessor to the NFL. He was a quarterback and kicker for the Shelby Blues, Maslin Tigers, Elyria Athletics, Coleman Athletic Club, and Akron Indians between 1905 and 1915. He coached the Elyria Athletics in 1912 and 1913, and the teams he played on won Ohio League championships in 1906, 1910, 1911, 1912, and 1914. Homer Davidson is considered the greatest pro kicker of his era just before the NFL started in 1920. Homer Davidson. Another uh, spare outfielder was Harry Bay. Bay got in two games, did not bat. Bay was with Cleveland from 1902 to 1908. This was the end of his MLB career. Harry Bay had been a fine outfielder for Cleveland, defensive outfielder and a pretty fair hitter. Harry Bay. Now the pitching staff, again, was led by our ace pitcher, Addie Joss. Joss batted 155, 15 hits, three doubles, two triples, 10 RBIs, three stolen bases in 42 games. Joss's pitching record was 24 and 11, with an ERA of 1.16. Wow, incredible. 42 games, 35 starts, 29 complete games, nine shutouts, and two saves. Joss was with Cleveland from 1902 to 1910. And he pitched a perfect game in 1908 on October 2 at League Park against the Chicago White Sox. Cleveland won the game 1-0. 11,000 fans came to the game. It was written that when the last batter was coming to the plate, quote, a mouse working his way along the grandstand floor would have sounded like a shovel scraping over concrete. In other words, everyone was real quiet. People were so nervous, hoping that he could throw a perfect game, and he did. And his opposing pitcher was 40-game winner Ed Walsh, who uh, threw a four-hitter and lost the game one to nothing. So this was con- some consider this the greatest uh, pitching duel, pitch- pitching duel game of all time. After the game, Addie Joss said this quote: "I never could have done it without Larry's and Stovall's fielding, and without Birmingham's base running. Walsh was marvelous with his spitter, and we needed two lucky strikes to win." Uh, he was optimistic after the season, you know, when the Naps had d- d- fell just short of winning the pennant, and he said this, quote, We'll win next year. We had some bad breaks this year, but watch us in 1909. Now, late during that perfect game, the 
crowd was very quiet. It was reported that cigars were unlit, the cowbells were silent, and horns and whistles mute. People were, would bring cowbells, horns, and whistles to make sounds, but everyone was quiet. After the final out, the crowd surged onto the field. Now, Addie Joss had, had wanted no part of that big crowd, so he took off. After the final out, raced towards center, center field and beat the crowd and made it to the clubhouse. He did not want to be hoisted onto their shoulders. Now, you know, you can imagine players were starting to get worried about uh, getting hurt by crowds. You know, and that went on until the, I know it was going on in, into the 1970s where they allowed uh, the fans on the field before they finally cracked down because, you know, it wasn't, sa- it wasn't safe. The second pitcher in the rotation was Bob, Bob Dusty Rhodes. Rhodes batted 222. He had 20 hits, two doubles, two triples, four RBIs, two stolen bases in 37 games. Rhodes' pitching record was 18 and 12 with an ERA of 1.77. 37 games, 30 starts, 20 complete games, and a shutout. Rhodes was with Cleveland from 1903 to 1909, and during 1908, Rhodes threw a no-hitter September 18th against Boston. Cleveland won that game 2-1. So in 1908, Cleveland had a, a perfect game by Addie Joss and a no-hitter by Bob Dusty Rhodes. Third pitcher in the rotation was Glenn Liebhardt. Liebhardt batted 175, 14 hits, 4 doubles, a triple, 5 RBIs in 38 games. Liebhardt's pitching record was 15-16, and 16, an ERA of 2.20. 26 starts, 19 complete games, 3 shutouts. Liebhardt was with Cleveland from 1906 to 1909. Glenn Liebhardt. Heine Berger was another starting pitcher. Berger hit 108. He had 8 hits, including 3 doubles, 5 RBIs, and 29 games. Berger's pitching record was 13-8, and eight, with a fine ERA of 2.12. 29 games, 24 starts, and 16 complete games. And Berger was with Cleveland from 1907 to 1910. Heine Berger. Charlie Chech was another pitcher. Chech batted 104, 5 hits, a double, 48 at bats in 27 games. Chech's pitching record was 11 and 7, with a tremendous ERA of 1.74, 27 games, 20 starts, 14 complete games, and 4 shutouts. Chech was from Madison, Wisconsin. He died in Los Angeles, California in 1938 at age 59. A career record of 33-30, and 30, ERA of 2.52, 187 strikeouts. Chech played for the Cincinnati Reds, Cleveland Naps, and Boston Red Sox between 1905 and 1909, and he was a curveball specialist, Charlie Chech. Jake Thielman was another pitcher. Thielman hit 348. Eight hits and 23 at-bats. Wow, two doubles, a triple, seven RBIs, a stolen base in 13 games. And Chech's pitching record was 4-3 and three with an ERA of 3.65, 11 games, eight starts, five complete games. And Chech uh, Thielman was with Cleveland from 1907 to 1908. This was the end of his MLB career. Jake Thielman. Cy Falkenberg was another pitcher. Falkenberg. Batted 118, two hits and 17 at bats, scored three runs, struck out seven times in eight games. Falkenberg's pitching record was 2 and 4 with an ERA of 3.88. Eight games, seven starts, and two complete games. Falkenberg was from Chicago, Illinois. He died in San Francisco, California in 1961 at age 80. Career record of 130 and 123, an ERA of 2.68, 1,164 strikeouts. Falkenberg pitched for the Pittsburgh Pirates, Washington Senators, Cleveland Naps, Indianapolis Hoosiers, Newark Pepper, Brooklyn Tip Tops, and Philadelphia Athletics between 1903 and 1917. He went to the University of Illinois. He was one of the few university-educated MLB players of this time. 1913 was his best year. He had uh, what they called an emery board, or I'm sorry, an emery ball, the baseball, he would, the baseball would be scuffed by a piece of emery board hidden in, the, hidden in the heel of his glove, which was legal until 1914 when, when it was banned. When the ball is scuffed, it's, it would move in a less predictable manner and was harder to hit. So it was, st- it was legal at that time to be doing that. Cy Falkenberg. 
Jack Ryan was another pitcher. Ryan hit 091, one hit in 11 at bats. That hit was a double. He had three walks in eight games. Ryan's pitching record was 1 and 1, with an ERA of 2.27, eight games, a start, a complete game, and a save. Ryan was from Lawrenceville, Illinois. He died in Hansboro, Mississippi. And his career record was 5 and 5, with an ERA of 2.88 and 32, and 32 strikeouts. Ryan played for the Cleveland Naps, Boston Red Sox, and Brooklyn Dodgers between 1908 and 1911, and he was a Red Sox coach between 1923 and 1927, Jack Ryan. Bill Lattimore was another pitcher. Lattimore batted 444, four hits and nine at-bats, two RBIs in four games. Lattimore's pitching record was 1-2 and two, with an ERA of 4.50, four starts, a complete game, and a shutout. Lattimore was from Roxton, Texas. He died in Colorado Springs, Colorado in 1919 at age 35. His career was just with the Cleveland Naps in 1908 in the MLB, and they called him Slothful Bill, Bill Lattimore. Ed Foster was another pitcher. Foster batted six times, did not get a hit, got a walk in six games. His pitching record was 1-0, ERA of 2.14, six games, a start, a complete game, and two saves. Foster was from Lebanon, Tennessee. He died in Montgomery, Alabama in 1929 at age 43. His MLB career was just with the Cleveland Naps in 1908, and they called him Slim, Ed Foster. Walter Clarkson was another pitcher. Clarkson's uh, batting average was 1,000. He batted once and got a hit, two RBIs in two games. Pitching record, he had no decisions, and an ERA of 10.80, two, two games, one start. And Clarkson, pitch, Clarkson was with Cleveland from 1907 to 1908. And finally, Jack Graney uh, was, a, was another pitcher. Graney uh, did not bat. He, he played two games. He had no decisions and an ERA of 5.40 in two games and uh, 3.1 innings pitched. Graney was from St. Thomas, Ontario, Canada. He died in Louisiana, Missouri in 1978 at age 91, a career average of 250. 18 home runs, 420 RBIs, 1,178 hits. And Graney played for the Cleveland Naps and Cleveland Indians between 1908 and 1910. And uh, I'm sorry, in 1908 and then from 1910 to 1922, he was on the team, he was on the Cleveland Indians in 1920 when they won the World Series. And then he became a Cleveland Indians radio broadcaster between 1932 and 1953. And my father talked about listening to games on the radio, Jack Graney broadcasting Indians games back in the 40s. In 2012, Jack Graney was inducted into the Cleveland Indians Distinguished Hall of Fame for non-uniform personnel. That was for his work as an, as an announcer. Graney was the first batter to face Babe Ruth as, a, as a, when Ruth was a pitcher in 1914. In 1916, Graney led the American League in doubles. In 1917 and 19, 1919, he led the American League in walks. In 1920, Graney's roommate and best friend Ray Chapman was hit by a pitch on August 17th by, the, by Carl Mays, and then he died. And so that was very, that, that was very hard. And was the first and only Major League Baseball player to die playing baseball. And Jack Graney was the first MLB player to become a radio broadcaster. Of course, early on, the games were not on the radio because there was no radio, but radio was, com was, was coming fairly soon. In 1984, Graney was inducted into the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. And in 1987, the Jack Graney Award was created for Canadian baseball journalists. Now, in 1908, in, in spring training in batting practice, uh, Graney uh, was pitching to Napoleon Lajoie, his manager, and he hit Lajoie in the head, which is not a good way to start one's uh, MLB career. But anyway, that's, that, that happened. Now, after the season, the World Series was played. The American League champions were the Detroit Tigers, who just edged out Cleveland, and they faced the National League champions, Chicago Cubs, who and the Cubs won the series four games to one. It was a rematch from 1907, and the Cubs repeated. They were back-to-back -back champions in 19, from 1907 to 1908. 
1908 was the beginning of the Cubs' 108-year title drought, which ended in 2016 when they defeated the Cleveland Indians in seven games. So that's the story of the 1908 Cleveland Naps. Boy, they had a tremendous year, and we can certainly be proud of them. And really something, they really achieved a lot. Didn't make it to the, just, it was also very painful, but still, you have to give them a lot of credit. God bless the fellows who played for the Cleveland Naps in 1908, and everyone else associated with the team, including the fans, especially Civil War veterans and the Spanish-American War veterans. Captains of the Cuyahoga, lovers of Lake Erie, Terminal Tower Power, fans of the Free Stamp Statue and the Fountain of Eternal Life, Euclid Avenue Electricity, First Energy Stadium Friends, Progressive Field Pals, Quicken Loans Arena Enthusiasts, Severance Hall Stalwarts, Tribe, Browns, Cavs, Monsters, and Gladiators Rue, Cleveland, City of Champions. It's been 70 years since 1948. This is our year. Go Tribe! Cleveland is the best location in the nation on the north coast of America. New York is the Big Apple. Cleveland is a plum. Thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.